Mm -hmm. Mark, the second chapter. Matter of fact, let me, let me go somewhere here before I get, give y'all a little time to find it. I know y'all. Uh, this, I read this. I thought it was kind of cute. It said, I, I feel like my body has gotten totally out of shape. So I got my doctor's permission to join a fitness club and start exercising. I decided to take an aerobics class for seniors. I bent, twisted, gyrated, jumped up and down, perspired for an hour. But by the time I got my leotards on, the class was over. Oh, I've sure gotten old. I've had two bypass surgeries, a hip replacement, new knees, fault prostate cancer and diabetes, half blind, can't hear anything quieter than a jet engine, take 40 different medications that make me dizzy, winded and subject to blackouts, have bouts with dementia, have poor circulation, hardly feel my hands and feet anymore, can't remember if I'm 85 or 92, have lost all of my friends, but thank God I still have my driver's license. That's scary, isn't it? <laughs> Woo! There are times I'm out there, it's not the teenagers I'm concerned about anymore. Amen. O over, uh, my, I was raised up with a dad who, you know, my dad had a rough upbringing, and uh, you know, he was in the military, and, uh, uh, you know, him, my mom, she was young. when my, my mom was 15 when she married my dad, who was 25. You can't get away with that. They had to go to, actually, they had to go to the state of Mississippi to make that happen. You couldn't even do that in Alabama. So, uh, you know, by the time my mom was 18, 19 years old, she done had all three of us kids. And, but, boy, she loved the ground my dad walked on. She loved that man 50-something years until his passing. But my dad could cuss anything. And I, I'm not trying to glorify cussing, but he just didn't have a vocabulary. And so he invented one. And, you know, I've heard some of you guys flare off a few times, but you ain't held a candle to my daddy. My daddy, a crowbar would slip or a tire iron would slip. Man, he'd go to cussing a tire, and it wouldn't change. <laughs> he'd cuss the paint, and he'd stay on the wall. It wouldn't change. But, I mean, he was good at it. And whatever went down, it just seemed like it always was an answer. The answer to it was just to cuss it. And I remember one time I pulled up in the driveway in my 72 Charger, and it, it was smoking everywhere and steam coming out of it. So I thought I'd be like my daddy. I jumped out and slammed the door, and I just went to cursing away. And when I finished, I looked over, and there was my daddy standing there. And he had a big old funny grin on his face. And I thought, you know, uh, I need to quit this right now because I don't even compare to that man. You know, he just he looked at me. It was funny. like He could say it and get away with it. But if I tried it, he's going to whoop me. So I had to quit that. But I found out that whenever you have crisis, the worst thing you can do is curse it. Because it happens in life. So I went back over a few years ago and, and pulled this old message out because it meant so much to me where we're at right now. The word curseth means to despise, small, short, to bring into contempt, or to treat with disrespect. You know, you can't escape crisis. Bring me up just a little bit, if you would, Robert. You can't escape crisis. Crisis is going to happen. David said it. it happens to all of us. You know, it rains on the just and on the unjust. Many try to avoid it. They don't understand it. They think if they're saved, somehow it shouldn't happen to them. And we live in, in a, it's still going on in a sitcom kind of world. We think somehow in 30 minutes with three commercials, we can solve anybody's problems. I was brought up with Brady Bunch. All in the family. You know, it seemed like whatever went on, the Partridge family, do you remember them? They rode around in a psychedelic van, and, and I, I remember them singing a song, something like, Come on, world, come on, world, hear the song that we're singing. Come on and get happy. Listen, Lori and I traveled 700 miles to Alabama with five kids when we first got married. Can I tell you something? The last thing we were, were happy. You know, I mean, it was stopping and whooping one and getting back in the van and going further, stopping, whooping the other one, getting back in the van, and are we there yet a hundred times? Drive me crazy. You can't settle everything in 30 minutes. Can I get an amen? amen? You know, we act as if we ain't got no problems, ain't, ain't going to have no problems. No, not us. But remember this, and you've heard me preach this about Nehemiah. When you begin to act on your vision, it will stir up both those who want to help you and those who want to hinder you. Serving God stirs up the enemy, the adver uh, adversary, and introduces you to your crisis. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to curse it. Mark chapter 2, are you comfortable? Come on, grunt and get up. If you, <laughs> some of you are funny. 
A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered, there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, everybody say their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow, preachers, these are preachers sitting there, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit what this, that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Father, I thank you for such marvelous word. I thank you for the knowing that, Lord, there's times when my faith ain't enough but my friend's faith pulled me through. Lord, I thank you there's times when people stand up for those that are less fortunate, and they, they bring them to the house of God. And then not only that, Lord, they bring them to you. So, God, I'm praying right now, even through the, the medium of, of the Internet, God, that you would reach and you'd touch people. God, let folk know everything's going to be all right. And then one day we're going to say, I've never seen anything like this. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Come on, get a little more excited in here. Everybody said? Amen. You, you may be seated. I found there are dimensions in God. And this is what happens. There are times when life goes along. And yes, the, the paralytic or, or, or the sick, the disease, or those who have financial issues, it seems like it's weighing on you and, and stays on you for a long time. But then there comes that time when, when people get desperate enough and they get you to Jesus. And when they got to the house, the Bible says when they got there, the house was packed with people. Jesus had come home. We believe this is Peter's house, actually, where he's at. And he's preaching the word to them. There's an excitement that's moving through there. And yet, even among the excitement, there's pessimism. There are preachers sitting in there, and I believe they're there to try to catch Jesus. They're always trying to put him down. And, and in most churches, I believe people are pretty optimistic. Some places there'd be some pessimism, I'm sure. But there are dimensions in God that we move into. I believe first in process. I believe process is important in life. But then I also believe there are times when God shortcuts process for our sake that he moves things up quicker. In other words, we're only here for just a little while. So these levels we move to and from. The Bible says we go from, from uh, level to level, from, from glory to glory. We, we step up. This is our life. That's why I'm saying that even though we got flooded, we're going to have an upgrade. Can I get an amen? We're going to move up. We're not just going to go backwards. We're not going to just barely get by. We're going to move up. There's times of abundance in one's life. There's accelerated favor. When God hits you and it's all of a sudden it's like you've been warp speeded ahead. You've moved into something new. I've often called them suddenly seasons. When a season comes in and suddenly everything changes. You don't know what's going to happen. One day your car, your truck gets flooded. Then suddenly you get a 40th anniversary Mustang convertible. It suddenly happens. It just happens, my friend. Acts chapter 2 says, Then the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly. Everybody shout suddenly. suddenly. Say it again. Suddenly. You ain't saying it quick enough. Amen. A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. It happened suddenly. They were there for days and days and days. Then suddenly, here it comes. You know, suddenly, let me tell you, that a new church starts. Suddenly, a family gets saved. Suddenly, a family is off drugs, alcohol, in their right mind. Suddenly, angels show up. Yeah, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward all men. There they were sitting by the fire. They had... They'd done this night, these uh, shepherds had done it night after night after night. It's what they did. The Bible says then suddenly an angel showed up. Are you looking for something suddenly to happen in your life? You know, if you look for it long enough, it's like, well, it never happens. I mean, oh, if you watch something long, it's just like watching ice melt. It takes forever. 
But if, but if you, are, when God's in a certain place in your life and he starts to move in, then suddenly something begins to happen. The children of Israel were slaves for 400 years. Then suddenly one night, all the same thing. The next night, they're heading toward a promise with the wealth of Egypt. Suddenly an earthquake at the jailhouse and a whole family gets saved. God is ready to send something beyond you to assist you. I believe that. Even through what has just happened, we went through crisis a month ago. It was one month. Crisis hit. We, you know, we had to make quick decisions. We had, thank God we had another church here. But everything shifted. Everything changed. We didn't know where we were going to live. You know, I mean, uh, uh, some of us escaped literally with our lives and a dog. Amen. We went over to Jay. Some of, we didn't know where we were staying, over to Glens. You, we, people were scattered. We didn't know where they were. We're still finding people. We're still finding them because crisis had hit. Everybody say, hello, crisis. Man, this just comes in. Suddenly, you know, you, you, you're getting ready for things in life, job interview, career. You, you know, here's what I would encourage you. You don't know when that suddenly moment comes. Go buy Bibles for your family members who aren't saved. Write their name in it and the date you believe in God for and see what happens. Prepare yourself for something like that. I think this is important. Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 2 tells us, so many gathered, there were no room left. Not even outside the door. So he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried before them. This is a crisis time. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. I'm looking for people that are crazy enough to do something like that. Just messed up enough. Just say, you know what? I don't care how packed. I pray that someday this house is so packed that I got to preach back here behind the drums. And they're bringing people through the doors on both sides. Yo, y'all, don't, y'all don't believe it can happen. I believe it can happen. I've seen it happen, man. I've seen things like this, and I'm going to see them again in my lifetime. I believe that. Some would have said, you know, if it was God's will, there would have been room in the house for him. There'd have been a seat there. But these guys said, we get, we done gone, we, 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 we've gone too far, and we're too tired. We carried him four, four, each one grabbed a corner, I, you know, and they picked this guy up. I guess it's a mat, and they bring this man there, and when they get there, they can't get him in the house. They know there's hope. This guy ain't said nothing yet. Now, I've, I've preached this from every uh, angle I can, but I want to tell you something. This man is a paralytic. He not said anything. You don't read one time where he opens his mouth. You don't read what he said, help me, bring me. These are four guys, that, and evidently he must have been a friend or somebody they cared about, and they just brought him in. They had a heart to do. This reminds me of what I've seen over the last month. People bringing help to one another. They don't even know who they are. We had the, uh, uh, the military show up and help us out. They didn't know us. I've had a guy from Missouri bring, uh, through Joseph brought 170-something chairs down and matched the carpet perfect. You'd think we were coordinators if you went out to the other camp. But we're not the coordinator. We serve the great coordinator. Amen. Amen. He just started putting things together and making things happen. See, a crisis said, I've invested. I've got something invested in this miracle. You can't talk me out of it. I'm going to do something here. When we talked about Nehemiah over the last month, we used this passage out of, uh, out of chapter 1. It says, when Sanballat, chapter 4, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria. And he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring these stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? This spoke so much to me as I'm reading this. And I'm thinking about our situation now and what's going on. And I realize there are things that the enemy wants to know about us. There were five things he wants to know. First, are they feeble? That's a good question. Is the little country church full of feeble people? Two people said we not. I said, is the little country church full of feeble people? No, we're not. Amen. Second thing they want to know, will they restore? The answer? Yes. yes amen. Will they sacrifice? Oh, no, 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 I got I to gotta, I gotta use it for this, this, and this. No, we sacrifice. Whatever it takes to make it happen, we're going to get it. Will they finish? Yes. Amen. We're going to finish our race. And will it last? Yes. 
Absolutely, it's lasted up to this point. It's going to keep right on lasting. These are the things the enemy wants to know because Nehemiah was in a crisis place in his life. You're not looking. You know, when people, uh, they, they mess up. They mess up. I, I drive, We rode all over East Texas, and I saw church after church after church. But here's one of my problems. Some people will look at a church building, and they think, you know what? That, that right there is their arrival. Let me, let me say something in my heart that I believe. This church is not our arrival. This is our destination. The, to, to those men who got inside that building, the ceiling was their floor. Everybody follow me? There's a floor, but this is also a floor. You get on top of a ceiling, now you're on top of another floor. Everybody down there is on one floor. I'm up here. You're on the ceiling. No, I'm not on the ceiling. I'm on my next floor. There are people that look at us and say, well, you know what? They're only going to have this many or that many. Uh, you know, we already got seven, 800 people that connected to our churches when they all come. I believe that's our floor. Amen. I'm, I apologize. I believe that's our ceiling. Uh, we're going to keep moving up. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Listen, you don't know you're an overcomer till you got something to come over. You've got to have something to come over in life. And somebody says, well, I'm an overcomer. You don't know if you're an overcomer. You don't know. I love the story of the boxing fight where, 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 the, where the man goes out to fight. And man, I mean, he gets in. He gets a bloody nose. His eyes are swollen. He, he's, he, but, but, but boom, the count to 10 goes off, and he's won. He goes back, and he sits in the locker room. They're taking the, the gloves off his hands. His hands are swollen. He, man, and after he sits down, they come in with a paycheck, and they hand him a paycheck. He, he's, a, he's an overcomer. But you know what the Bible says about us? We're more than overcomers. He gets a paycheck. His wife comes in there all pretty dolled up, blonde, makeup, not out of place. She takes his paycheck. He's an overcomer. She's more than an overcomer. Amen. Amen. That's how God looks at us. He done took the fight for us. He done took the beating for us. We're going to get to the other side. Can I get an amen? amen. Listen, hear what I find in life. Some, some folks will give up over a headache. They have a defeated spirit. Then there are those like these four with victorious spirit that are overcoming obstacles. They get to the house. They, they realize we got to come over this thing. But through the crisis, the ceiling then became their platform over Jesus. What someone has thought was a peak was now their foundation. A crisis pushes you to the your point of your miracle moment. Our lives are a series of miracles from the crisis we've overcome. Look, guys, I can look back over my life and many of your lives, and I've seen that you've had things to overcome. And when you overcame that crisis, you got promoted. You got a little more crisis as an indication you've outgrown your previous level. Something's fixing to happen. A child is born because it has reached its maximum size. The mom is thrown into crisis. It will be painful. That's why they call it labor. A contraction is an indicator that crisis is on the way. Then once that infant gets here, an infant has a crisis of nourishment. It causes it to eat. That infant will have a crisis of communication, and it causes it to speak in which it will never stop. An infant has a crisis of mobility. It will cause it to walk, and they never quit. You know, I used to think, think oh, you know, one day my boys are going to walk in, my girls are going to walk. And once they start walking, you're just like, oh, my God, I wish that I'd have never taught them to walk. Somebody got all excited because their kid walked at 10 months. Bless your heart. What a curse. <laughs> Amen. It had been better to held them back till two. But once they start, they don't stop. Crisis could be pushing us to our next level. I believe that somehow through even the flood, again, I don't believe it's God sent, but it is God used. And through that, God's going to push us to another promotion. We're going to go to another place. It causes you to make a destiny decision. Some of you, some of us have already, I know, have moved to other places. Some I know that are moving. And I have no, no slight against that. I think, you know, if some aren't, it has nothing to do with the flood. It's just the time for them to move. But whenever you go through a crisis in life, prepare yourself for the next promotion. 2 Kings chapter 7 tells us that there was a terrible famine in Samaria. We've never been there before. We, our nation, I can't remember any time that our nation has suffered the way Samaria did. They were besieged on the outside by the Arameans, and, and they shut that city down. The Bible says, as, as bad as this sounds, the women turned to eat in their own children. They were selling donkey heads and dove dung as food. Food fed to lepers would be thrown over the wall to their misfortune. After a while, there was no food coming over the wall. There on the other side of the wall, again, was four men. Four men outside the wall waiting on scraps. When I was a kid, we fed the hogs scraps. 
We fed our dogs scraps. I can't remember ever having a bag of dog food in our house when we were kids. The dogs ate the scraps. They ate the squirrel guts, rabbit guts, deer guts, whatever we had. You know, they would eat that. And, I mean, you ain't got a good red hound unless that dog can eat all that before it hits the ground. That's a good dog. And our dogs were trained that way. I mean, that's, they, they were prepared, and then whatever was left over, that's what they ate. We're real healthy today, aren't we, Sister Peggy? Amen. We're very healthy with how we take care of our animals now. But here it is. These four men are outside the wall. And one day came, no, no scrap came over the wall. Next day came, no scrap came over the wall. They're lepers. They, they, they've been pushed outside. They had to beg for everything they got. It, it was a misfortune to them. Their fingers were falling off. Their nose was disfigured. Their, their ears were gone. They're in a terrible way. And there's four of them. And, you know, they probably didn't have a mirror. And every morning, one of them would wake up and look at the other one and say, Well, what do you think? Well, you had a rough night. <laughs> Looks to me like that nose is about gone now. You know what I mean? They're just looking at each other, and they're wearing their little clothes, and, you know, and they're sitting outside, and they, one of them gets a revelation. And I love the revelation. Now, there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay we here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. Don't you love common sense? If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we're dead. Now, I don't know which guy is the leader here, but he, but he, yeah, okay. At dusk, which is early in the morning, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp as it was, and they ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents. They ate and drank. And carried away silver and gold and clothes and went off and hid them and they returned. You know, you know, I don't know what it is. When you've never had something for a while, you always hide stuff. Huh? You just hide it, man, because you, you, you fell into good fortune. You don't know what else to have. That. They returned and entered another tent and they took some things from it and they hid them also. Then they said to each other, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we're keeping it to ourselves. Now, when I read this, they were in crisis. Why set we here and die? That's a crisis. We ain't been there. But they were in a place in their life where if I stay here, this, we're going to die. So they start heading out, and God amplified. Oh, yeah, there it is. That's what they did. Amen. God amplified their feet. So every time they stepped, their feet would amplify through the valley. And as they were walking, they had no idea that it was their feet that was making that noise. And as they're moving closer to the camp, they can see the lights. And you can imagine the intrepidation, the fear of knowing these guys could kill us when we get. They could kill us for just being ugly. They could take us out because they're afraid of what we got going to get on them. So when they get to the edge of the camp and their feet have been magnified as they're walking through the place, they get there and everybody's gone. They look in the first tent and you see all four of them peeking there. They're turkey legs, pork chops, whew, silver coins, gold coins, necklaces. Oh, man. And then they said, this is wonderful. Good, good country food. Then they go over to the next tent. When they get to the next tent and they walk inside there, oh, man, it's like a, it's like a Mexican fiesta. There's tacos and burritos and enchilados. And they're everywhere. Oh, man, this is good. And they eat some more. They go into the next one. It, it looked like little Italy. They're lasagna. Oh, man, this is good. And they're sitting there and their stomachs are so full. And they're thinking to themselves, we got it made. This is good. When I got born again, I was so excited about what God had done in my life. The last thing I wanted to do was keep it to myself. 
I felt like these four lepers, that, that God had cleansed a very ugly man who needed all the help with his cursing and all the, 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 the filthiness of my mind, that God had cleaned me up, and I had to go tell somebody. So everybody I met, I'm like those guys, I'm heading back. I'm going back to the city. Now, I, I can't go into this whole story, but there was a man there, a very pessimist man, a leader of the place, that said that, that uh, guys, this, uh, uh, we're all going to die. This famine's that bad. But a prophet had stood up and said, this time tomorrow, God's going to bless us and turn this thing around. Somebody say suddenly. Suddenly, suddenly something's going to happen this time tomorrow. Now, who would have thunk it that four lepers are the ones that are going to cause this thing to happen? So they go back, and not only do they go back, but they got chili dripping down their lips here, you know. And, and, and I mean, they, they, they didn't get healed, but they did get blessed. Amen. And they're on their way back in, and, and they just left a crisis, and they've just been promoted, all four of them. They, they're the most popular men now in Samaria. And when they knock on that door, and they got a turkey leg in one hand and, and, a, and, and a big old ham hog in the other, amen, and one of them's toting a big old pot of pinto beans, and one of them got cornbread, and they knock on the door, and they say, Hey, guys, you ain't going to believe what just happened. We went out to the enemy's camp. And none of them are there except all this food and silver. And the Bible says when they opened up the gate, the people were so hungry, they rushed out. And that one guy stood there and said he tried to stop them from going. Read the rest of the story. They ran over him and killed him in the street. Just, just, just smashed him down. Don't get in the way of my victory. Don't get in the way of my blessing. Amen. You might find yourself getting run over. Amen. So they rushed out of that place. You know, it is your crisis that postures you for your next promotion. Now let's start closing this thing down. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, can you imagine that scene? Four guys get there, and they get on top of the roof, and they start making some noise. What I liked most about Jesus was he didn't rebuke them while he was preaching. He, just, he, he heard the noise on top, and they began to pull the roof off. Oh, there was a crisis going on. Man has a, has a, he's a paralytic, and as, a, as they're pulling the roof off, and, I, you know, I, 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 I know it wasn't shingles today. I would think about ripping a shingle off of, of apathy and a shingle of, of hatred and a, uh, a shingle of uh, uh, pigmatism and, and ripping off shingles like that. But, but they dug a hole. These were, these were uh, 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 dirt roofs. So they began to dig and dig and dig. You, you can't lower a man through a hole that big. You got to go out about a six or seven foot wide, long and three or four foot wide. And as you dig it, it's falling through. So Jesus down there preaching. Blessed are the poor. And here come the roof caving in. Blessed are the meek. And then he looked up there at four guys and their heads just sticking through this big hole. And he said, Blessed are they that hunger, thirst. They'll be filled. All of a sudden, they take the man and they start lowering him down. I guess they kind of put a ropes underneath him or something. And they just begin to let him down. Now, everybody has to get out of his way because they're going to bring him down on top of your head. So they lower the man down. He's on the ground now. He's sitting there and he, he's got that paralysis. and He's probably kicking around. He's looking around and can't believe what's happening. The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith I'll be honest guys we've all gone through things in life where our faith is shattered we're just barely hanging on but if I can have somebody stand up next to me and say pastor your house is gone but I'm telling you you're going to get it back the church is, is, is wasted but you're going to get it back uh, if you can stand beside somebody who's struggling in life with their own disease in their body and say I know you're struggling right now and, and I don't want to be presumptuous but I've got faith that somehow, some way, God's going to make that right in your life. He's going to change some things, going to turn around. I know your bank account looks pretty bad right now, but I want to tell you about four guys I know that went out to a place, and next thing you know, they were wealthy. You don't know how this thing's going to turn around. The benefits of a flood, there are people that are smart enough, and don't take this wrong, to make money off this thing. So what looked like a crisis to you was a promotion to them. Amen. They turned that thing around. I was just up with a friend of mine in Quitman, uh, Texas, sheetrock guy. He's on his way down here. I said, get down here, son, because I'm going to tell you that a lot of folk need sheetrock, and they need it done good. 
and you're good. So promotion comes from the Lord. You, you never know what's going to happen. Faith is a this, this powerful thing to have. And yet Jesus told Peter, Satan desires you that he may sift you as wheat, that you're going to go through a crisis. But I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Your faith is so powerful if you can hang on to your faith. Sybil, I'm praying for your faith. But only that, I got faith for you too. I'm believing God. I, I, I know your body's been wrecked and this and that's happened. I'm talking to my sister on the back row for those that don't know you. I love you, girl. I've watched God work in your life. That man of yours stand right next to you. So I'm praying in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, that, that report of the tumor. I stand believing, God, that you're going to remove it. Take it away. Give her life. Promote her. Favor her in Jesus' name. Amen. Here they were. They lowered the man down. He ain't said a word. Jesus looked down at him and said, Son, your sins be forgiven. I got to ask a question. And listen to me real well. What sins does a man who's a paralytic have? What do he do? He steal something and roll away? He snatch a woman's purse? Roll up under a table? I'm going to tell you what he did. He did, he did what all of us do. He envied the blessings of others. I can't run. I hadn't ran since I was 16, since they fused my foot. But I've watched other people run, and I envied them. I want to run like that. Can't run. Foot's fused. I can do the honky hop. But can't run. And that's just a little thing. This man can't walk at all. He's envied other people his whole life. He's looked at four men brought him in. Where's his parents? I've envied the fact that you've got a good dad and a good mom. You envy people. It's a sin. So he looked down at him. He said, Son, your sins are. Did I say this to you? These, these are powerful words to me. When he said son, I'm careful who I call son. son. Some, some people just like to call everybody son. I don't. If I call you son, I mean it. And when he said son, your sins are forgiven, he looked at him then as Jesus being his father, which means I, I got you. I'll take care of you. I see you. All the religious people rose up. I said, who does, who does he think he is? God to forgive sins? <laughs> they see that in their mind. And Jesus perceived what they were saying. Be careful what you think. He got you. Jesus perceived they thought that. And he said to the guy, oh, to the preachers, does that bother you? that I would forgive him of his sins? Does that upset you that I have the power to forgive sins? You said only God can do that. Well, let me show you something else only God can do. Son, rise. Take up your mat and walk. I, you, got, you got to see it. He, he gets up and all of a sudden muscle begins to form around his bone. His sinew comes up around his leg. He finds himself pushing himself up on those legs and, and his arms. And, and he gets up from the place. And, and it's like, ah, yes, you got to imagine. It's like coming up out of the grave for the first time. He stands up. There's no dizziness. There's no, there's no hurt. There's no pain. And he, he, he rolls his mat up. And, and he, he starts to walk out of the room. There had to be an excitement. Take up your bed. Well, he's on his way out, forgiven of his sins got a new body see this is why you got to get to heaven with me because i want to find this guy i want to know what happened later because in my heart i believe he went and hung out with them four guys for the rest of his life four guys on top of the roof they high-fiving one another yeah baby yeah 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 this is good church now i'm telling you don't curse your crisis and wherever you're at, don't curse it. Don't get upset because finally you, you, you heard a bad word here. You got flooded there, a disease here. This happened to that. Don't curse it. 
Stand there and say, God, I believe this is my promotion. I believe you set me up for something higher than this. Listen to me. Listen to me. When, 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 the, when, the, when our church got flooded, all I believed in was promotion. I believe that the next stage is going to be better than this stage. Whenever this body goes through crisis, one day it will be such a crisis, the heart will stop, the brain will shut down. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to promote me to my next body. Whenever you spiritually get into a place in your own life where you realize that, that, that your body's corrupt, that, that your mind is messed up, and, and then that you're going to hell, what are you doing? You're in a crisis. What is the answer for that? Promotion. What's the promotion? Being born again. Getting a new start. Stand with me. Oh, Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords. God, remind us right now that our crisis is not the end. It's a promotion for something to come over. God, you set us up. For some, Lord, it's a minor, but it's major to them. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, with heads bowed, eyes closed. If you've been away from God, would you put your hand up right now? If you've been away, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Anyone else before we pray? Thank you, ma'am. See, I'm telling you, the crisis you're in right now is a setup for your promotion. There has been an adjustment, not only of your mentality, but your spirituality, and understand that suddenly God's fixing to shift everything in your life. There's going to come a suddenly moment but everything changes. I'm not here to say the wind. I'm just here to tell you to stay prepared. So as hands lifted, let's pray together. Jesus, I stand here in need of promotion. Take the sinfulness, the meanness, the hatred, the unforgiveness from my life. God, put me into a new place, a ceiling, if you would, a promotion. I want to be born again change my life only you can in jesus name amen come on bless the lord in here a week or so ago i talked to you about a woman who had a crisis in her life and all she had was a little bit of oil remember that that's a crisis she said i'm gonna take this little bit of oil i'm gonna make me a cake me and my boy's gonna eat it and die that's a crisis instead the prophet said to her take that oil Make me first the biscuit. And I promise you it never run out. And then go gather all the pans you can. And then pour it into the pans. And her boys went out and they gathered and they got in a secret place in the back of the house. And they began to pour the oil out of that little, vi little vase she had. And it filled everything there. You can't curse your crisis. You don't know when a suddenly moment's going to come. When something's going to take place in your life. And a matter of fact, the Bible says... Her, her boys were going to be sold off as debt but he said now you can pay your debt off which means you can keep your boys and you can live on the rest of your life and what's left over so I'm here to tell you don't curse your crisis I see this all through scripture where somebody had a crisis and if you curse it and you get mad at God and you walk away and you get bitter you ain't learned nothing in life you actually showed your maturity level but if you sit there and say God listen now I'm going to take this right now so I want to tell you now Will they sacrifice? I believe that. One of the ways I've, I've got myself through life is to give my way out. I mean, uh, I was in a restaurant the other day, and all I did, every time somebody walked in, I'd, I'd, I'd give them money. Go over there and buy stuff. There were our kids coming. I ain't seen them in, in a month. I just get, every time I want them come in. Because I, I actually have it to give, so I just give. But when you don't have it, when you give it. A man was watching me and observing me. And he said, sir, who are you? I said, I'm the pastor of a little country church. I know I don't look like it right now. But that's actually who I am. And we began to talk. I believe this man will end up at our church. But people are watching and observing. And God will put you in a place. Uh, and you've you got to realize that everybody, first off, goes through crisis. Yeah, all of us do. All of us do. When I do funerals, I see crisis. But I also know there's promotions. Promotion comes from the Lord. So I'm not educated enough. What edu what's education got to do with being promoted by God? Amen. Some of the smartest people I know were not educated in the institutions that I know of. Some of the dumbest people I know. Well, I won't go there either. <laughs> Sybil, I'm standing and praying for you and believing God for you. Amen. As I would anyone in here. 
Thank you for celebrating the North Campus. Thank you for celebrating them. We're believing God for something great when we get out there. Amen. Amen. Be seated for a brief moment. Our servant lead us to come up.